today's webinar. My name is Tanisha Camillo Sheffi, founder and director of Made Incubator, revolutionizing the way designers learn, build, and succeed in fashion. And we want to thank our sponsor, A Maven's World, and also New York Life for being a corporate vendor of this series. We are so excited to have you, and our industry experts are really ready to mobilize your business. So ask the questions, don't be shy, and follow us on Instagram at Made Incubator. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Happy Saturday. We are back here again for another wonderful, wonderful session of this series. This has been an incredible series. Good afternoon. Um, we are so excited for this discussion today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we have been hosting this Entrepreneurship Empowerment Series event during Black Business Month to connect, inspire, and mobilize minority businesses and to get the resources that they need to scale. So this virtual series is presented by Made Incubator, revolutionizing the way designers learn, build, and succeed in fashion. Today's event is also sponsored by Maven's World's lifestyle brand, uh, building brands, empowering entrepreneurs, and making mavens. My name is Raina Jacques, and I have been your hostess. It's been such a pleasure uh, for the last couple of series, and today we are, are closing out with such a wonderful guest on our show today. Um, I'm an attorney by trade, uh, but I love being a creative director and an entrepreneur as well. And so just as much as you're all learning, I am here getting all the essential tips today. Uh, we'll be diving into business development and community impact. And I am super honored to welcome and introduce the phenomenal culture shifting representative Liz Miranda. Uh, Liz is a longstanding community advocate. She's a friend and she's a sister to many of us. Representative Miranda is the state representative of the 5th Suffolk District and is running for state Senate in the 2nd Suffolk District to build a district-wide agenda for community belonging, healthy equity, and economic opportunity. She's a community organizer, former youth worker and entrepreneur who ran for office in 2018 after gun violence unfortunately took the life of her brother. Since taking office, Representative Miranda has been a tireless fighter for the constituents of the 5th Suffolk District and families across the Commonwealth. It is my honor and pleasure to welcome Representative Miranda. Hi, thank you for being here today. Oh my God, I've just been admiring your hoops. So I just gotta say <laughs> thank you for that introduction and thank you uh, to the sponsors and my lifelong friend, uh, Tanisha. She looks so gorgeous. Yes, she does, too. always. <laughs> I'm always in awe of just the power and beauty of black women, um, the resiliency that we bring to all of our work. So thank you, the honor is really mine to be here today. Oh, thank you so much, Representative Miranda. And please tell us, I know we just gave a wonderful introduction, but please tell us about yourself and how did you get started as an entrepreneur? So I'm a Roxbury girl. I grew up in the Dudley Triangle, um, which is a part of Roxbury that was the most environmentally unjust community. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two movies, um, Holding Ground and Gaining Ground and a book called Streets of Hope about my neighborhood. Mm. Uh, I like to say to people that we went through the worst of times, uh, redlining, uh, legal trash transfer stations. We had 1400 parcels of vacant land. Yeah. Uh, we had white flight. We had arson for profit. We had every social ill uh, that could happen to a community uh, right after busing, right? Um, and that let, that was long before we had the crack epidemic and um, other ills of violence that happened in our community. So I went and grew up in this community. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I saw so much hope and promise. And I was active in an organization called Nubian Roots. Mm -hmm. um, that was a youth organization, part of an organization called the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. And I saw people, everyday people, some immigrants from Cape Verde, like my family, some Puerto Ricans that moved from the South End, some black people that came from the South and also were living in the South End. All these people were moving into this community that no one wanted, mm. right? 
nobody wanted. But you know who wanted, who wanted it, who fought for it were the people, everyday people. And so I think that my love for entrepreneurship um, really came out of a junior achievement class. Um, in my neighborhood, I was part of a lot of youth organizations because my mom, who was a teen immigrant mother, came, um, you know, she came to America in 77. Uh, in 1980, she gave birth to me. She was 17 years old mm -hmm. and she had to go work in a hotel. She had to be a cook. So she dropped out of school at Madison Park High School and she had to provide for me. She worked for 16 hour days. And I know so many people here, I'm not a mother yet. Um, mm -hmm. I like to consider myself a community mother, but I remember growing up in a household where my mom worked really hard and she was like, never give up on yourself, focus on your education, dream big. And so by the time I was 13, 14, being in this Nubian Roots organization, I also took advantage of all the other programs that were around. Um, so I was involved with teen empowerment, uh, my town, the Orchard Park Teen Center, but one thing that I remembered as I was looking over the questions was I actually at the age of 14 took a junior achievement class that taught me about financial literacy and about starting my own business. And I like now it hit me that like when I became an entrepreneur at age 20 in college, because I was bored, I went to Wellesley <laughs> and I was like, man, there's a whole lot of women here. And I was like dying to bring people together and socialize. And so I started throwing parties on my campus uh, with the skills that I learned in my junior achievement class about marketing, a sales wow. pitch. Um, and those things came back to me. And that's really how I got my star. I started throwing parties um, on the campus of Wellesley. And soon folks who owned nightclubs, folks who were promoters, in the city of Boston started coming to my parties to promote. Cause it's, it's before social media, you actually had to get flyers. Whether <laughs> <Yes. laughs> it was snowing, whether it was raining, you had to, you know, and the hustle, I think that also was complementary to what I learned um, mm -hmm. in um, that junior achievement class. I remember them teaching me about the five Ps hmm. You know, a lot of times we learn about the four P's, um, but their fifth P was philanthropy. And so I think the giving back nature of me starting my entrepreneurial endeavors were always with me. And the hustle um, that I had to use to survive my neighborhood and thrive in my neighborhood and get to Wellesley, I think that combination is really where I got my start. That is awesome. That's such an amazing foundation um, to be able to just really pay close attention to your community and just say, hey, you know, I'm super proud of where I come from. I know where I'm going and I, you know, I certainly cannot wait to be able to come back and share all the resources that I've been able to gain over the years. And it's, it's such it's we always forget how lucrative just that those small moments in the very beginning that can just spark uh, the rest of our careers and our lives. So there are some people women listening. And I want to be clear that, you know, one of the things that I think is the wrong thing to tell women entrepreneurs is that you have to sort of be ready. Uh, you have to be well packaged. Um, you have to wait until it's your time. And if one thing about my life has taught uh, me, I've also been an educator. I taught entrepreneurship at the community college level. Mm -hmm. um, I taught entrepreneurship with the Center for Women in Enterprise. I ran the Community Center for Entrepreneurship um, in my 20s after um, spending 10 years in event management and marketing. And the thing that I want to share is that there's usually an opportunity or crisis that happens in your life that like rings this bell around, yo, I am worthy. Yes. I am enough. And I see something in me that can be in whatever industry. So whether you're an artist or a baker or a financial analyst or a real estate agent, I, for most of my life, have been dealing with folks telling me I'm not ready, I'm too young, I'm too hood, mm -hmm. I'm too, uh, I'm a product of a teen immigrant mother. I come from a community no one loves. 
Uh, actually, Roxbury is a well sought after community, but I just wanted to share that message of that because when I became an entrepreneur, so many people would, co would correct me. Mm. And they'd be like, well, you're not an entrepreneur. You didn't go to business school. Or they'd be like, entrepreneurship is for the ecosystem of startup economies. And I'm mm. like, are you kidding me? I built this from the ground up. I'm an entrepreneur. Absolutely. I was made in this community. So just for folks to understand that. It's really Absolutely. And can you expand a little bit more about some of the challenges that you face? I know that you, you've uh, touched a little bit on it just now, but what, what are some of the community challenges that you face just as a woman, as a minority, both personally and professionally? One, there were no assets, right? To start my business, I was working two jobs in college. Mm. And I've worked two jobs most of my life. And I really didn't have, you know, a lot of people talk about it's bootstrapping, um, but there's really no bootstrapping um, for people that actually have two parents um, or you're giving an allowance or you're given some assets or inheritance. If mm -hmm. I had those things, things would have been easier. So the first challenge was that I didn't have the money to start my business. Mm -hmm. And so I concocted this really great idea um, where I would work with promoters um, in the city of Boston. I would have three requirements. I would get in free with all my friends <laughs> and had drink tickets. <laughs> I couldn't afford to buy drinks. Very smart. <laughs> I wouldn't have to wait in line. Right. Because part of what I was building was to show sort of a, a energy of ex exclusivity yeah. or being an insider. Mm -hmm. And the third was that I'd get paid um, for bringing people from different college campuses to these nightclubs. Mm -hmm. And they had, they adhered to that. I didn't realize until much later that my two dollars a head or five dollars a head was nothing compared <laughs> to what they were making and so eventually i shifted but that was one big thing the mm -hmm. second was that it was a male dominated sexist industry mm -hmm. uh, if they weren't trying to sleep with me they were trying to rob me mm -hmm. um, or let not pay me what I, what i was worth or take advantage of me and my friends because we were younger mm -hmm. and they didn't think we were wise and so being in that space, um, I was well prepared for because I grew up in a community where when we would tell people I was from Roxbury or my parents were immigrant or my father was incarcerated or uh, my brother was in jail or my mom was a cook. I'd always lived with this sort of stigma mm -hmm. of trying to fight people's perceptions of me. Um, and the third was when I was in, the, you know, people would laugh about it now. Um, but I remember 617, the, the, the young, they were Jewish and Italian young men who were promoting at the same time I was. Mm. And I remember feeling like I could never beat them. Mm. Um, and eventually I did. I had a nightclub. Someone gave me an opportunity. Um, and my friend Shendi and I were the first women and first Black people to be given a nightclub night on Lansdowne Street. Wow. And Lansdowne Street was in the middle of sort of the College of the Fens. And we were given an opportunity to start a Thursday night that became honestly one of the best nightclub nights ever. We won Best of Boston. Um, but that gentleman giving me an opportunity, I just remember talking to Ace and them. I was like, y'all couldn't make a Thursday night pop, but we did. <laughs> and so I think the third challenge was really being like, being able to say to people, just give us a chance. Mm -hmm. Even though we were young black women from the neighborhoods, um, we did really well and sort of opportunity, talent is everywhere, but access to opportunity is not. Mm. And so that was a third big challenge was just finding the opportunities uh, to say to people that we could do it. And we grinded it out. We worked so hard. We used to have Black Planet in my space. Yeah, I remember those days. <laughs> and I would work. I would go to classes during the day, go work my two jobs. And then between 11 p.m. Um, and literally 8 a.m., I would promote the nightclub. Wow. I would uh, do my homework and would start over every day. 
And so I think the racism and sexism and ageism were a big part, but getting people to believe in you and give you an opportunity, mm -hmm. pay you um, so that I could build my business because there was no capital. And the third was really this sort of sense of like, even being in a male dominated industry, there was still a path forward. What I didn't know before I became an entrepreneur and started my company, my first company was Ewa Live. My name's Elizabeth. Uh, the number one has always been in my life. It was my jersey on my basketball team. Mm -hmm. I was also in a sorority and my number was number one. And so, and then live uh, was just the idea of this energy that I brought to my events. And I grew up in this industry um, really learning as I went. And so this is why it was important for me to say uh, to the women and the young people who might be watching today, mm -hmm. start where you are with what you have. It is yeah. Absolutely. And I tell uh, people, entrepreneurs, uh, young people all the time how important it is that as, as long as you're taking initiative, there's always going to be a sponsor somewhere that's going to see that light in you and just want to harness that and push you forward, sometimes with nothing ever even in return, just to be able to to say, I knew, I knew this person was going to be amazing. And I'm glad that I was able to be there and push them. So that's so and awesome. And my sponsor, uh, sis, one of the things that Ray, Ray Montgomery was the man who gave us the chance. Mm -hmm. He said to me, you keep telling me what you're not, but what you are is a woman that makes you more empathetic and compassionate. Mm -hmm. um, you're a hustler, you work really hard. You're not lazy. Um, he said, you're creative. So use that feminine energy. And before you knew it, you know, folks not only wanted to party with us, but literally just work for us. Right. Um, there were people from every college, from Northeastern down to other places who would be like, hey, Liz, like, you know, you're doing such a great job. And people talk about your energy and your work ethic. And I just I go to Roxbury Community College. How can I help? I go to Bentley. And so just use what you also have because I didn't realize I had that. Right. You know, I've been spending my whole life being told I wasn't enough. Right. And just to get like to you needed to combat something, like you needed to fight something off when really you're just, you're attracting everything. So That's, thank you for sharing that. It's awesome. Um, um, and also, do you remember the first time that you had to use your voice in, in advocacy and, and, and stand up for something? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I remember um, between ages 13 and 16, um, I was going through a lot in my life. I'm a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. And uh, my father wasn't in my life. My mom worked all the time. And although I was really studious and worked really hard um, academically, I was really struggling in community. Mm. I was struggling in my family. I had a big immigrant family. They didn't, I didn't think they understood um, what it was like to be a young, pretty girl growing up in a community where every day, part of the things that we had to fight was to keep ourselves safe. Yes. Um, not only safe, um, from violence or safe from the sort of degradation that people inflict on people who are poor or from different uh, backgrounds. But the idea of like growing up in a community where older men and people were just predators. Mm -hmm. And I remember getting involved with Nubian Roots and I had my first job. It was called the Dudley Environmental Action Leaders. And we decided that our community didn't have bus stops and didn't have trash barrels. And so we were fighting the city um, mm -hmm. to say, well, why is this downtown and not in Roxbury and Dorchester? Like you say our community is dirty, but you don't come and clean it. You don't provide the tools in the snow, in the rain, people who didn't have much we're standing at bus stops getting poured on and cold because they didn't think we deserved that. So I remember using my voice then to fight for those community goods. Um, mm -hmm. And now when I walk down Dudley Street, because I own a home in that community, 
I see bus stops, I see trash barrels, I see homes, I see schools, I see parks. And it's 20 years later, it's 25 years later, but just to see that sometimes you start with the mustard seed and you start now and you don't see the gifts of your fruition or the blessings till much later. Mm. And so what I didn't realize is being taught how to use my voice in public speaking, how to present to boards, how to present to leaders actually helped me throughout my life speak for myself and advocate, uh, particularly for black and brown girls yes. um, like myself. And so I remember that vividly. I remember standing in rooms with my feet shaking mm. and being taught that as long as I go slow, as long as I keep my feet planted on the ground, as long as I speak, even if my voice cracks, that people will hear me. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's an important thing for, I think, women entrepreneurs particularly to understand that maybe not everyone hears you, but if there's that one person in that room that hears you, um, and I just want to share another story that happened much later. It wasn't the first time I used my voice. Mm -hmm. uh, but after I had already had a career, I was uh, running a community center in Boston. That was my dream job uh, to take my business skills and my nonprofit management skills to help young people. Mm -hmm. And I am in a room and I had never told people my story of abuse. And I'm in a room at Newton North High School and I am meeting with the Medco students. And so I had a room full of 40 young women. And I don't know, something came over me that just said, speak truth, speak your truth. Mm. And I tell the young ladies about surviving abuse, surviving domestic violence, surviving a community um, that was violent, incarceration in my family. And multiple girls started crying, mm. right? And I could sense that they felt a sense of freedom mm. to share their truths or even just release what they were holding. Because I didn't realize, I was 28 at the time, I didn't realize that I'd been harboring this secret forever. Mm. And I couldn't tell anybody, but that these young women appreciated. And so I just want to say to folks, you never know who you're inspiring by trying. You never know who you're inspiring by speaking your truths. And you never know who you're inspiring um, by sharing your story um, of resilience in entrepreneurship or in any other field um, that we are in. That is phenomenal. That is phenomenal. I love that. Speak your truth. Stand present in, in who and what you are, you know, and just, you know, what a wonderful time to be able to create such a safe space, even in the midst of your own fear, for these young women who probably wouldn't have would have been harbored harboring those emotions for a lot longer. So what an incredible space. And when you were talking about um, being able to see the fruits of your community work much later, I think for me what what that says is is change is possible when you're persistent, um, when you're when you're really uh, consistent about and 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 adamant about your position, just how it can actually happen with patience, <laughs> but it can happen. Is that what what led you to politics? You know, I don't think it was that. You know, I've had and just I'm just taking a moment here. I'm in my office. It's a closet in my convene <laughs> office. There's ten days to go. I'm staring at a map uh, and you uh, of my <laughs> district and I have my vision board above my head. If you had told me at seven, at 17, at 27, at 37, mm -hmm. that I would be a two-term state representative, that I would have filed and passed six bills when I didn't know how to write one, and that I'd be running for Senate in the same generation um, that I am the daughter of a teen immigrant mother, I would have told you that that was impossible. Right. From where I started, 
I would be like, there's no way. I didn't see any politicians that talked like me. I didn't see anybody that looked like me. I didn't see anybody that had the background like mine. And I really um, think that the most pivotal thing that led me to politics, now mind you, I've been in community work for 25 years and I still didn't feel worthy. Mm. When I saw politicians, I saw white men who were middle-aged, cisgendered, who were from towns like Wellesley. Mm-hmm. You know, they were enough. They were mm-hmm. lawyers. They could run our government. Um, but I didn't see a hood girl whose rainbows weren't enough. You know, I didn't see that in politics. I saw Ayanna Presley be the first black woman on city council. I mm-hmm. saw, um, you know, learning about Mary McLeod Bethune and Barbara Jordan. So I knew their stories, but they were so few and far between. But right. in 2017, two things happened in my life that were tragic. Um, mind you, I'd, I'd survived so many other things. And in 2017, my youngest brother, Michael, was killed. Mm-hmm. He actually went to the same nightclub that I got my first start in wow. and never made it home. Um, someone shot him and his friend and uh, stole their chain. And he was the you know, he was the father of two young boys. And I remember getting that call after watching my brother party on Snapchat uh, mm-hmm. and talking to him on Snap. And then two hours later, he was gone in an instant. And I was really confronted with this moment about, I thought I had a good life. I did everything people told me to do. Mm-hmm. I went to school, I graduated, I gave back, I dreamed big, and I wasn't able to save my own little brother. Hmm. So after months of grief, I was like trying to ask God, like, why me? Like, what am I going to do? You know, my father had been deported. My brother was in jail. My eldest brother had also been deported. I was like, why do I have to suffer so much? But my brother's death inspired something in me. You know, sis, I've been trying to figure out what it is. It's like this wind, this energy, this fire that came over me. And so six months after my brother's death, I ran for office. I beat four men. I set a record in my district and I won every ward and precinct. Now this is chills right now. (laughs) I like to think that Michael somehow you know, um, and I didn't want to get emotional, but sometimes I think women are taught like to not allow their transparency and vulnerability show up. But I am one that really doesn't believe in that. Mm-hmm. And I want to say to everyone, like my brother's death still impacts me. Saturday last week was his fifth year gone. And every day when I walk into the state house, I think about yo, maybe Michael was like my guardian angel. Like he was like, there's something dope about when you have nothing to lose, Mm. your back is is against the wall, when people don't believe in you and they say all these things about being inexperienced and young, that the people who are marginalized often say, well, you're our girl, you're gonna be our woman, you're gonna be our representative because it matters. So. I took my pain and turned it into power. And that's why I'm saying to most folks, you can learn how to start a business. You can take an online class. You could go to webinars. You can even go to school for it. But what you can't learn is hope, heart, and hustle. Mm. Hope, heart, and hustle will take you places that those business classes can. When you're late at night and don't know how you're going to pay pay payroll, what do you, what do you need? <laughs> prayer, some dollars, but that you got to go out and get it. Right. Right. And so I think Michael's death was a very pivotal moment. And then the other thing that I did not know in 2018, because I'd put it in the back of my mind was my sister gave birth to a baby that didn't survive in 2017. Mm -hmm. And it was so traumatic that I think that I hit it in the back of my mind just to press forward. And when I got to the state house and I learned about the poor birthing outcomes uh, Mm -hmm. for black and brown women and also our babies and birthing people, 
-hmm. I made that a focus. So gun violence prevention and uh, birthing justice. And even though I'm not a mom, I know that we have to keep fighting for families. And so I think those two things coupled with some great hope, heart and hustle have led me to some great places. That's so empowering. Wow. You've said so many great things just now. I don't even know where to start. Number one, absolute chills by the story that you've shared with all of us um, about how, you know, the passing of your brother affected you. And also six months later, you were you were right there in front of everyone and showing the world who you are. And I think that's just such a testament to you and just how fearless that you are. And I think in the middle of, of it, you're probably saying to yourself, what on earth am I doing? And it's it's the same when you're starting a business. It's the same. You have to be a little crazy. You got to be a little crazy. <laughs> and I read a book at the time that was feel the fear and do it anyway. And I wasn't fearless. Mm. I was scared out of my mind. Mm. But I kept hearing this 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 voice and feeling this energy that what happens if I don't try? Right. Are there little girls and little boys in my community who are like, I could never be that? Like, why? Why? And it brought me back to my younger self where I felt those things. And I didn't want kids in my community to feel that way. I didn't want single mothers to feel that way. I didn't want men returning back from incarceration to feel that way. I didn't want undocumented immigrants to feel that way, that like their life doesn't have purpose. Because it does. And so that book is something that I recommend to a lot of folks and entrepreneurs because there's a lot of fancy business books. Um, but that was one that spoke to my spirit. Um, that was really helpful. That's amazing. Um, and I know that you, you've you touched on two of, of wonderful passions that you have, you know, being able to settle gun violence in our communities, um, as well as birth and justice, especially for Black women. Are there any uh, more causes or, or how have you been involved to be able to spread those initiatives? Yes, so I have been. I'm really excited. I'm talking to the group that I am today because one of those bills that I passed was equity in offshore wind. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very passionate about small business. I sit on the small business committee at the state house and particularly around uh, the ecosystem of technology and the startup economy. Mm -hmm. We literally have a whole neighborhood dedicated to the startup economy that hasn't trickled in the 23 neighborhoods Boston has. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of opportunity in, I think in tech and biotech and life sciences. Um, Boston has top five industries, but the offshore wind industry, sports betting and cannabis Hmm. present the best opportunities for new energy and voices, um, particularly non-traditional voices. And we're going to have a wind industry that's going to help us save the planet. Hmm. So environmental justice is definitely one of my big causes because of how I grew up. I knew that my community was more polluted. We have higher asthma rates. We saw who got COVID, we saw who died of COVID, and that just is because our neighborhoods are literally making us sick. Mm. And so putting the equity language in offshore wind ensures that they're not gonna skip women, they're not gonna skip people of color, they're not gonna skip people that maybe don't have a Harvard degree and Wellesley degree like myself, that they're going to focus on the people and create those pathways. So I hope there's someone listening that wants to build wind turbines or build the nut in boat um, that will become the women uh, enterprise that the state will uh, grant the contract to, uh, to help us with that industry. And so there's a, a piece of every industry in the Commonwealth that is here already or is coming that provides an opportunity. Um, the other things I'm passionate about is immigrant rights. Mm -hmm. I helped pass the driver's license bill um, and I have another bill called the Safe Communities Act, which makes it illegal for officers to ask people in traffic stops about um, their status. Mm -hmm. ha 
help them get their light fixed or the tire fixed. But we do not need you to make someone feel fear um, when they're approached by an officer, because we know policing in our communities is not the same. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I'm very passionate about is voter rights. And so I just passed a bill on jail-based enfranchisement. And there are about eight to 10,000 people incarcerated pre-trial, which fundamentally is wrong, um, right. in Massachusetts, or serving a misdemeanor who have the right to vote, but don't have access to the ballot. Why does that matter? In a community like Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, uh, Black people make up about 20% Black and Brown people of the state's population, but 70% of the carceral system. Mm -hmm. And so to make sure that those men and women have access to the ballot is a very important thing for our communities, because when you look at the geography of incarceration, um, I like to think that everything that I've worked on has a connection to my life. Mm -hmm. I'm the daughter of immigrants. I had a father deported and a brother. Um, I've been going to jails, visiting family and friends since I was a little girl. Um, today, I visit 350 uh, incarcerated people a year um, because I want them to know that they're not throwaway people. Uh, people are not, and I, this is a very important message I want to share to people who have made mistakes. We are not the worst thing we've ever done and we're not the worst days of our lives. Mm -hmm. and I think that's very important because when we talk about hope, a lot of people feel like they can't be something because they've made a mistake. I've made many, um, but I'm not 18 year old Liz. I'm mm -hmm. 40 year old Liz. And a lot of people get second chances, but oftentimes the second chances do not trickle down to people whose parents don't have the legal background, mm -hmm. or don't have the funds um, to get them out of jail or the connections and relationships um, that we don't have in our community. So I just want folks to know that if even if you've done, made a mistake that's cost you your business, you can rebuild, you can start over. Um, you're not at the end of the road. Um, and that's an important message that I've heard from actually people incarcerated that's helped me outside share that with many people that have opportunities that's wonderful um and very inspirational what a visionary you are <laughs> i would have never thought about um the off-wind industry especially in massachusetts and i know there's a lot there's a lot of individuals who are booming in, in getting into the tech industry. Black girls are coding. Um, you know, a lot of engineers that are breeding out of our communities who I think would be such an incredible asset to, to the that bill and the project that you're, you're pushing forth. Um, and you said a wonderful, wonderful thing about um, those who have hope and who need the hope to be able to have a second chance. Um, you know, as you know, I, I was a prosecutor for an, uh, three years and um, being able to to see both sides of it. And also I was able to see a lot of uh, people who rehabilitate their lives um, and build businesses and become enterprising individuals and go back into their communities um, and focus on the youth so that they don't go the, in the same direction, or if they are in that direction, if they can pivot them in, in some way. So that's wonderful. <laughs> um, we have a note from, from Kavana Jones that says, thanks for being, for doing, for sharing. Um, she says, uh, this is why the sheriff's race is important elections in 2022, making sure folks who are incarcerated have access. Thank you so much. Um, and I wanted to share, thank you Kavana for that. And this is why I'm on a business webinar mm -hmm. talking about politics um, and business because everything in our lives is connected to who makes those decisions at the state house and in that white house in dc and you know whether you're getting grants whether you're getting loans low interest loans whether your bank is doing what they need to do to ensure that you can um, get private lending uh, as well. All those things happen. How, what school you get to go to and is it a resourced school? Um, these things are political in nature, but we have been so, I think, 
what's the word I'm looking for? So pushed to the margins that sometimes people feel like mm. our leaders are not showing up for us, but you can. Actually, early voting starts today. And if you're an entrepreneur or a small business owner, whatever you wanna call yourself, mm -hmm. um, just know that like putting your faith in people who you can hold accountable is a very important part of our dem democracy yes. in this country. Yes, absolutely. And I definitely want to take this time to, if anybody has questions, to please put it in the chat. Um, and while we wait for those questions to come through, um, I'd like to ask you, you know, what, what out of everything that you've said today, what is a, a major advice that you can give uh, to startups who are looking to expand their opportunities in this city? So the city of Boston is on a new horizon. We have a young woman of color as mayor. Uh, we have a chief of economic inclusion and opportunity. Iduwa, Chief Iduwa Shigun. Uh, we have a director of small business, Ms. Persina. Mm -hmm. City Hall looks and feels more like the city of Boston than it ever has. Mm -hmm. On the state level, we have some work to do, but we're going to have a new governor. <laughs> um, but we do less than 1% with minority-owned businesses. There's so many barriers to contracting with the federal government and with the state government and the city government. Um, and so one of the things that I want to focus on um, is ensuring uh, that folks get access uh, to the designation of being a veteran owned business, MBE, a WBE, or a disabled or differently abled, like I like to say, business owner. We should be doing more business with women, with more people of color, with more veterans in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And when you get that designation, if we can remove the barriers to entry and bidding, you can get multi tens of thousand dollars with multi-million dollar contracts to just serve food, make clothing. Um, and so I, you know, for one piece of advice is that for me is that I'm going to do a better job and push my colleagues. But the one advice that I can share is never start learning. Mm. All of us are teachable. And I think sometimes folks get stuck on well, I have this degree or I've learned this and I have this skill, but you can always grow. You can learn a new language. Uh, you can learn some marketing tactics that you don't know. If you're not good with social media, you can learn um, through other people. So just being teachable and never stop learning uh, is an important uh, piece of advice that I can share to entrepreneurs. But when I get in the Senate, just come check for me, send me an email, call mm -hmm. me and say, hey, I want to do business with the Commonwealth and I will shepherd you to the appropriate people. We have to do better. Yes. We have to do better. Yes, we do. And how are some of the ways that you, what are some of the ways that you think Boston needs to do better with helping and support its creative economy uh, and youth development? Um, one is that about 10 years ago, or maybe it was a little longer, there was a shift in funding youth programs and many youth programs closed. Some of the programs that uh, I believed in, so my town closed its doors because it couldn't get resources. Teen Empowerment, which used to be a big organization in many high schools, went down to three sites. Um, the Orchard Park Teen Center was actually demolished. And so with the city where one in three people are under the age of 35, and many communities in the inner city have either 20 to 40 percent young people under the age of 18. We have to invest in youth development and youth programming. Um, also, organizations like NIFTY, Junior Achievement, Youth Venture, they're incredibly important to inspire young people. But in, sometimes they're in our schools and not in our community centers. When I took that junior achievement class, it was in my neighborhood down the street. Uh, folks know, if you know David H, he's a great filmmaker and videographer and photographer. He was in my class. He now has a successful business um, filming weddings and doing videos. He did my campaign video. Like he is now making the type of money we only could have dreamed of. Wow. Uh, when we were kids. So I think that putting those uh, community organizations inside where young people are 
is important because not everyone gets that opportunity in the school. We have failing public schools. And if they don't have those programs, make it available after school. Um, That's important. And another way that I think we can do better, we live in a multicultural, multilingual society. Hmm. Most people are running micro businesses with less than five people, or you're running it as a sole proprietor. Mm -hmm. We do need to take state um, classes and opportunities and city classes and opportunities and bring them to the hood. We, We should be able to walk into a building in Dorchester or Mattapan or Hyde Park or Jamaica Plain Mm -hmm. and say at eight o'clock at night, be like, I've been running my business all day. I have two kids, but I wanna learn. I wanna learn how to take uh, my muffins that I make every day and figure out how I can scale up to provide muffins uh, to Bain Capital. Mm -hmm. And you should be able to do that in your community at your own time and leisure. And so those are three ways that I think the city can do better. That's amazing. Um, And how can we all support you in your efforts to keep our community at the forefront of inclusivity and innovation? Where can people go to vote for you? How do we stay connected with you? (laughs) Uh, One, my website's lizmiranda.com. My socials are at Liz for Boston or at Rep Liz Miranda. Um, And really it takes three things to win a race. Folks investing their time, their talent and their treasures. Um, what that means is treasure. Whether you have $5 or 50 or 500, invest in someone you believe in. I just got endorsed by the Globe this morning and it's, yes. it's uh, an amazing- Put your hands in the chat for Representative Liz. I was like, the Globe? You know, I'm getting text messages at 7.30 in the morning. I'm sleeping like, are you kidding me? Um, <laughs> treasure is important because if you, do not invest in women running for office. They will not win. It's very hard uh, for women to run for office. I saw uh, more Healy this morning, Congresswoman mm-hmm. Ayanna Presley. I saw a candidate for AG, Andrea Campbell, this morning. And all of them said the same thing. Help us get to that place. Um, time. Do you have two hours to phone mm-hmm. bank, knock doors, put up signs? Um, are you going to vote early or by mail so that on election day you can give some time to help someone win? Um, and talent, do you have a skill? Do you make flyers? Um, are you a financial analyst and can help? Uh, do you work in development? Do you have a skill or something that you can give someone instead of just money being like, hey, I don't have a lot to give right now. I'm stretched. I don't have a lot of time because I'm very busy. But you know, I, I can make food uh, for your volunteers one night a week so that you don't have to pay $100 to feed 20 people. Mm-hmm. So just those time, talent, and treasures help someone who has a dream to run for office get to the finish line. Time, talent, and treasure. That is amazing. I think that people don't realize it's the little things. It's yeah. the little things that, especially to keep your endurance going and and to keep everybody motivated um, is very important. And so I'm going to congratulate you in advance because I already knew, I already knew when I, when I was um, in law school, (laughs) striving to get to that finish line. And I saw you at Cafe Nero. I said, here she is the beacon of hope <laughs> for us all. You no, know, I love coffee too much. It's- <laughs> <laughs> and it's, I mean, as if I can, if I'm saying that to you myself and just seeing you as an inspiration for us as, as women, as black women, as young people um, out there and just being, even in the midst of our fear, just doing it anyway. And so we're so grateful to you and, okay. um, And congratulations in advance. I'm speaking into it. I'm so excited for what's coming. And and thank you for being here and dropping these amazing points. I hope everyone had their journals out because there were a lot of gems of dropping today. (laughs) And, you know, I will leave this with everyone, um, particularly women. We need each other. We don't have to be best friends. We don't have to agree on everything. Maybe even our politics are different. Um, but we need each other. Uh, We need each other to sponsor each other. We need each other to collaborate with one another. 
And I just hope that you take my story of turning uh, trials into triumph or pain into purpose to know that it is possible for you. But none of us get anywhere alone. Mm -hmm. And so it's really incredibly important that I hope that you take my story and think about um, one, giving yourself a pat on the back, keep dreaming big, keep grinding, whole part and hustle, but that you think of another woman in your life or another woman in your ecosystem mm -hmm. um, that you can call up today and say, you know, are you okay? Um, how can I help you get to one thing that you want to get done if you can help me get to one thing that I need to get done? And you'd be surprised whether that person can babysit your children so mm -hmm. that you can go take a class or whether you can use your social media presence to shout out another business. We do not lose our light by lighting another candle. So go off, do big things. Remember 10 days uh, to this election, vote for women. Yeah. Uh, make sure we get in the state house and uh, shoot me a text or email after September 6th, because I That's can't answer anything right now. But <laughs> after September 6th, shout out to the Made in Incubator. I love it. It's like Made in. Made in Incubator. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I love it. And shout out to everyone and you. I've seen you come a long way and just going through law school and becoming an attorney is not easy. It is the least diverse field in this country. Even government is a little bit more diverse um, than the law. And so Encourage y'all, go out and do your thing. Thank you so much, Representative Miranda. Thank you so much for everything, for your wonderful words and for joining us and being the change that we need. Your work in changing lives of so many people and just breaking cycles, breaking curses, and just really facing the issues of our community today is so important. So I'm so excited for our attendees today to reach out to you, to support you, to give their time, their talent, and treasures. Um, and we'll we'll get you there. We're going to get you in there, girl. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Toya, thank you so much for making this. Tanisha, I see you. You're doing big things. And so all the women, keep dreaming. I'll take care. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, a Maven's World, for your support. Uh, thank you, New York Life, for being a wonderful corporate sponsor throughout this series. And we close this series with such a renewed hope for the future of our city, for the city of Boston, for all of our Roxbury and Dorchester communities and High Park, where I'm from. <laughs> and um, we're, we hope that this discussion doesn't stop here. Um, that, that we're able to take all of the gems that we've taken today and continue and be part of the change that we want to see um, in our community and in our city. So thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your weekend.